Hey everybody, I want to talk about a product and platform that I absolutely love and our latest sponsor, Interseller, the prospecting and outreach platform of choice for recruiters and sellers. Whether you're doubling down on business development or recruiting talent, Interseller does all the heavy lifting of finding contact data, automating the email and follow-up process, and syncs all that rich data into 20 plus CRM and ATS platforms. Reach out now and get going on a two-week free trial and let them know you heard about it from Adam on the podcast today. Check out the link on the website. Appreciate it. Welcome to the podcast, where we introduce you to incredible humans who share their journeys with the mission to inspire you to harness your own inner tenacity to drive your life and career forward. And now, your host, Adam Posner. Hey everybody, welcome back to the podcast where I bring you the best and the brightest from the world of business, marketing, and talent access to help you harness your inner tenacity and drive your career forward. Folks, I am a guest in my guest, Joe Mulling's house today. I'm thrilled to be here at Dragonfly Stories. What's the official name of the studio, this Joe? This is 160 Studios uh, in Delray Beach, Dragonfly Stories. Thank you so much for having me, and thanks to your fantastic staff for welcoming me and my family who are in the green room. So this is a really special episode. I was here with Joe about a year ago to the date almost, pre-pandemic. I think we were kind of talking about it a little bit. We were. This studio was not yet anywhere near where you see it here. And things were a lot different back then a year ago. Mm -hmm. We were in a, a different state yeah. and a different time. I left here inspired. I remember walking out in the parking lot and I called my wife and I said, babe, this is what it means to me. I need to build an empire like Joe. And you lit my fire. You didn't just light my fire, Joe, but you poured aviation fuel right on top of it. So I wanted to say thank you for that. Uh, and a real quick note to everybody. I know I've been talking about this a lot, but there was this moment. Uh, it was around March 15th last year. Uh, Joe and I got on the phone, the pandemic was happening, and he said something critical to me. He said, listen, you have to make a choice right now. You can either curl up in a ball and die, or you could grab this thing and own it. Mm -hmm. And you grabbed it and owned it. Yeah. yeah. And yeah I you took did. It. You've just been, you know, again, you could have went fetal or, you know, just go attack it. And you attacked it exceptionally well. So. And you also, and thank you for that, and you also instilled a word in me if I was going to get knuckle tats, tenacity on one mm -hmm. uh, and invaluable on this one. Mm -hmm. And you said something else to me. You said, right now, you need to be invaluable to your clients. There may not be business right now. There may not be opportunities in front of you. But what you can do is continue to add value to those clients, not ask for a single penny. So when we come out of this pandemic, you will be at the top of the list. And that's exactly what's happening now. We're recording this on February 17th, mm -hmm. right? 17th? Yeah. yeah. I'm losing track of days. 2021. So let's get into it right now. You got it. The world of recruiting has changed the process mm -hmm. on many different levels. Mm -hmm. The candidate pools have opened up. Roles that were, that were focused on only being in a certain geography, a certain city, now that's opened up to pretty much anyone in the country, anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. What are you seeing on your end, Joe? <clears throat> so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Right now, it's, it's, it's survival mode. It still is, and it probably will be through calendar 2021, probably into the Q, best case, Q1 of 2022. And so, you know, the, the categories that are hiring are generally driven by software, firmware, hardware communications. That's where you have your explosive growth. If you look at the food and beverage business, the restaurant business, that what they do hasn't changed, how they do it has. Correct. So you have to think about that in all these new categories. So the, the demand uh, are call centers. The demands are software development. The demands are firmware development. You know, I think 80% of our GDP now in the United States has a service arm attached to it from the GDP perspective. So as these organizations now, we're, we've got it custom to working from home. And uh, that now has allowed us to go expand out and say, well, if you can work from home in Silicon Valley, why not work from home from Detroit? Um, It'll be interesting to see longitudinally, though, what happens on comp, right? So that's, that, that's going to be a big dynamic coming up. I, I personally think, um, and I'm going to use this word on purpose, the worker is going to win. And I love to see this. You know, when I started my career in 89, all my peers were kowtowing to the companies. And I knew back then that if I earned the trust of the candidate database, and everybody knows I call them the individual. But for this piece, the candidates. If I own the candidate pool, 
meaning the trust, the access, the conversation, be standing there in plain sight when you don't need anything and be there when they need something. Um, the candidates now have the power in the workforce. And if you keep that in mind, um, you know, this candidate opportunity pool job market, you're gonna have more opportunities for yourself. Very well said, obviously, from Joe with your years of experience, but how is that gonna play from a compensation perspective when a company says, all right, someone in San Francisco, their cost of living is so much significantly more than somebody in the middle of the country, hmm. why the hell should I pay them the same? Because you're not paying them for the cost of living, you're paying for the talent pool. And so you're, you're gonna have conflict there. This is not gonna go away overnight. Right. What you're gonna start to see happen, though, is you're gonna start to de see a decentralization of available talent. Um, I think there are people who love living in San Francisco, as an example. I think there are people who love living in New York, as an example. Um, but you're seeing, like, Goldman Sachs moving a large part of their team down here to West Palm Beach, Florida. You're gonna start, you, you already saw before the pandemic, you had Google, Amazon, um, uh, Apple, all look opening headquarters in Chicago, Boston, even Israel, Tel Aviv, for talent. And so it already was starting. Right. And so, you, you know, the second somebody wants to underpay you because of where you live, not your skill set, it's up to the worker, right, versus the employer to hold a hard line on that. And believe me, I will guarantee you at all, when a client wants a candidate, an individual, they will pay 20% above market almost every single time. Paying for talent. The thought that I hear, and the word that I hear on the street from candidates, I'm in the trenches, I'm recruiting daily, is that candidates want a choice. There mm -hmm. are folks that want to be in an office, they love the camaraderie, they love just the, the, the human interaction, the collaboration, the energy there. And there's some folks say, listen, I've been doing this my whole life, I love being home, I love having my own time, my own hours and everything. They want trust, they want the choice. Mm -hmm. Some companies are saying, no, we want you back in the office, and they're gonna lose potential candidates. They're going to lose current talent there. That's an, in, in, from my point of view, that's going to be a big divide. The companies that say we're going to give you a choice and the companies that say they want you back in the office when things are open. They're paying for real estate. They're paying for, you know, to cost of, of having an office in New York or a major city, mm -hmm. that's a huge expense that needs to be justified. What are you seeing from your point of view? So it's interesting being a business owner and having, uh, in, in, you know, cumulative 17,000 square feet of space. My business model and my salaries and my compensation plans and my commissions were all based on having a very large footprint. And so, you know, those conversations are gonna happen like, well, I'm not in the office anymore, I'm not using all the resources anymore, I should be paid more money. I said, I understand the conversation, um, but your side of the model hasn't changed, my side of the model has, so that's one. Two is, beyond economics, here's my concern. If you've been in the workforce for 20, 25 years, 30 years, you absolutely should, should still be learning. And most of the time, though, that should be self-learning, self-education, upskilling all the time, especially when we may get into that conversation about the people who are moving into their 40s and 50s who now may be out underemployed or unemployed um, or furloughed if that's still happening. My biggest fear right now with the work from home force, and think back in your career, those first one to five years out, the mentoring that takes place. I've been talking about this all the time. In the yeah. conference room, in the hallway, in the men's room, in the bar afterwards. The level of education that occurs in the mentoring and the champion that you get behind you. Look, as a business owner who's 59 years old next week, when I see a young stud who is willing to run through walls and I see him or her every day in the hallway or I see them eating lunch at their desk, you know what, when I get a chance, I give them a better shot on goal than somebody who's spending an hour in the lunchroom or somebody who's coming in later at work or leaving earlier. I, I fear for that enormous gap that's gonna happen in the work from home place. A hundred percent, and I talk a lot about this with my clients too, and it comes down to hiring, especially at those junior levels, why they look for a certain level of skill set to have already coming into a job. We're not talking about entry level jobs, mm -hmm. but if we're talking at that seven to 10 year mark, maybe a little bit earlier than that, you need to come in having these skills because they're unable to teach side by side. They don't have the time to train. They don't have the time to look over your shoulder. So they need somebody who could jump right into the fire. Now when we talk about folks just coming into the workforce, 
it hurts to see how much, from my perspective, what they're losing out on. Mm -hmm. They don't have that mentorship. They don't have that side by side. You have a, a, a leader or someone you direct report, that someone you directly report to, that's at home with their kids, unable to give you their full attention that they would if they're side by side in the office. The big piece missing here, aside from the training, is that initial culture. The hardest part for young people coming into the workforce, from my point of view, is them adapting to being workers, worker bees, mm -hmm. going from you know, college or, or if they're not in college to that lifestyle, going into the workforce, being disciplined, getting into a routine, learning how to engage in a workforce. How do you talk to someone you know, 20 years your senior? Right? How, do you, how do you engage with them? And you learn that by watching other folks on the That's job. Right. Right. The other piece, too, is culture. If so much culture is built in that interaction, that vibe in the work in the office, you can't replicate that on Slack. I don't care how many Zoom calls you have. Do you think a lot of companies are going to lose their identity, where a culture was such a big part of it, what, from a talent, a talent um, acquisition point of view? No, I think this is going to be an enormous explosion. I think the next. 10 years in uh, talent access business, whether you're a headhunter, RPO, contract, wherever you are, this is going to be the most amazing time, amazing time from an economics perspective, uh, from the number of placements you're going to make, assuming you make the shift in this digital wave that's coming. How so? Well, I don't think that technology is going to replace the recruiter. I think that recruiter who uses technology is going to replace the recruiter who doesn't. So what do I mean by that? <clears throat> HR over the next, at least the next five years, HR has always been under-trained, under-resourced, and for some reason somebody threw, and you and I have had this conversation before, the access of talent into HR, two totally divergent skill sets, two different sides of the brain, left side, right side, 100%. creative side, organizational side. Right? So somebody about 70, 80 years ago said, you know what, you put the ads in the paper, you have the people come in, because once they're in, you're responsible for them. Well, the, the ability to reach people now has been, never been easier. Look at, you look like a platform like LinkedIn. I've taught that 10-4-2 strategy that's caught fire, is caught I can viral. get in the inner circle of anybody at any time with less than one week of intelligent access directed at my target. Mindful, but, intentional if targeting. If not, but four, right? So that digital platform. You're also going to see HR is now going to be left with environmental health and safety issues, mental health issues in the workplace. Big time. Redistribution of how workers come in and out. They were already not super effective at talent access. Now that's going to disappear. So what are they going to do? They're going to insource that, co-source that, or outsource that. You're going to see organizations come in. You're going to start to not hear the word RPO anymore. You're going to start to see sourcing solutions, staffing solutions. It's going to be empowered through the digital side, but the digital side of engagement now at scale around the world, right? So that, and then employer hiring branding, the smart companies are going to do that, even the small companies. are going to start to show who will you become when you come to work at my company. And they will spend... Four hundred, five hundred, six hundred thousand dollars a year. Companies that maybe only have fifty million in revenue, because they will get better access to better talent, and you'll allow the talent in the market to have a longitudinal view over six, nine, twelve months of what that company stands for. And in this generation right now, they're as interested in what they do for work as much as who they do it for. And it's a fascinating point, too, and I think it's really interesting from the talent access perspective. We've, we've had the talent access, and I've changed my offering to a talent access consultancy. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm an RPO. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you want to strip it down and call it what it is, I don't ever use that. Mm -hmm. I'm a consultant to my clients. Mm -hmm. We come in and we're a white label extension there. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about how the interview process has changed. Mm -hmm. Incredibly, it's gone to Zoom. Mm -hmm. All those pieces that you take for granted in the traditional interview process, what we're doing right now, being able to tell body language, how nicely shiny your shoes are. You can't smell Joe right now, but he smells pretty good. So let's talk a little bit about how that has changed, especially we'll talk to like that mid-senior level uh, roles. Yeah, well, you know, you point out the obvious. First, it's gone to a two-dimensional um, stare into a screen, into a camera, right? So one of the things that's super interesting is, everybody's been guilty of it, is your initial contact with employer, employee in that interview process has an unconscious bias tied into it immediately. So as soon as you come in, you have an unconscious bias, either pro or con. 
You then spend usually the rest of the interview defending that. Now, it's not evidence-based. What it's based on is your internal hunch. Preconceived right? notions. That's right. And then so that comes in, and then you continue. So one of the best pieces of advice I give people is li neither like or dislike the person in the first 10 minutes. And then you can start how do you do that? that. Tactically, how do you do that? You become strong in your mind. You don't, you don't, you don't buy into the person. You don't get influenced that they've got a $4,000 watch on, or they've got a pair of $500 shoes, um, or their nails are chewed up because maybe that weekend they were laying bricks in the backyard with their kid. Right. Right. So it's you've got to you've got to always give the person across from you the benefit of the doubt that they're trying their best. That is one of the best ways to override anything. Uh, in the interview process. You're here doing the best that you can, right? So that will sort of mute or, or, or at least dull the unconscious bias because that's what you're trying to defang in there, right. right? So you lose that in the interview process as a pro and a con, yeah? Because the way the person smells, the way the person's skin temperature feels, the way, again, the shoes unshine, how the they body language. The best, body language, all that. And so now you're moving people into a two-dimensional environment on Zoom. And most people don't have a self-awareness about how they appear on Zoom. As a guy who does, like most people now, I'm not special, dozens of Zoom meetings a day. Um, cameras up the nose. Uh, the angle. <laughs> bad thing over the shoulder. Yeah. Blown out in the back. Simple lighting. Bong in the corner, right? <laughs> I mean, there's things that happen, and, and people aren't looking at you. They're, they're looking at everything going on. They're making judgments at the same time, Correct. to your point. Correct. So, you know, one of the advice we've been giving to people is, get beyond your resume. So we're creating a product right now in one of the companies I own called um, the Candidate Locker. That's, the, that's the, the code name for it, not a code anymore. And we believe you're more than your resume. And it's a product we're building that's gonna be password protected, that is gonna allow, it's almost like a passport, that you will allow to selectively send it to any job board, to any hiring manager, anywhere, and they will get a code that they can open it up. And when they open it up, you're going to be more than your resume. It's going to be certainly your CV, but it's also going to be how do you want to declare yourself to your future employer? You might have videos with your kids. You, you've got a beautiful daughter in the green room next door. You may want to show you playing dress up with her and having fun with her, a deeper sort the of view. The personal side, the character. Whatever you decide. You might be a great wakeboarder. You might be getting a private pilot's license. And so now what you're doing is you're creating this larger perspective of who you are, and what's really important here is it's going to negate the people who are gonna get turned off by that. Well, you didn't wanna work in that culture anyway. And that password protection will have, you'll be able to see when it's opened, you'll be able to see when it's passed off to somebody else with a pixel attached to it. Mm -hmm. So it's your passport, you're in control. We firmly believe that the individual needs to be in control of everything. This is a shift. The time has come, in my opinion, and so many others, that we need to shift away from the resume. Mm -hmm. The problem is, with such a flood of candidates coming through the traditional interview process, how the heck else are you supposed to look and filter out and say, okay, we need certain skills for this role, we need a certain caliber, a certain level of experience. Mm -hmm. How else are you gonna filter people out to really get to the true character of somebody that you're only meeting in a few interviews? Because mm -hmm. what I've seen is you really don't see true character until someone is in the job. Yeah, it's too late. Right? I mean, you could check references. I mean, we've had this conversation before. Who the hell gives a shitty reference? Too, unless you're a really good reference checker, right? Right. You know, like you or I. You get a private detective on the case, we and can, you're back-channeling, yeah. and you're yeah. going through other yeah. sources there. Yeah. But the resume is archaic. The resume is what you put, put the on there, too. The whole process is The whole process is archaic, and nothing's going to change. Well, it will. Big it companies will. need to start making the shift and set the example. No, they won't. They're going to follow. So I think what you're going to see is what, what historically has happened in, in, in organizations is the larger ones are the last movers in any of these shifts. Too big um, of a boat. Well, too big of a boat, and they usually will get pitched a solution that is so broad um, and, 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 and so uh, uh, sort of directed at the entire workforce. So how you hire a Mahogany Row executive should be an entirely different process than how you hire a one-year coder coming on the desk, yet Agreed. in a majority of organizations. The same process. How they feed that process, how they populate that process, what that funnel looks like, et cetera, is all for the most part you know, uh, the same. So I think you're gonna see the change in the organizations that are either startup organizations or those that are less than 100 employees. Because they really care, when you start to add five people to a 100 employee company, you change that 
organization dramatically. Proportionally, the Those ratio are force is multipliers. Correct. Right? To have a force multiplier occur in a 1,000 person organization is very difficult to do. And though, you know, there's, there's stats out there that say the Pareto effect is when you have 100 people in an organization, the square root of the number of people you have in an organization do 80% of the work. So if I have 100 people in an organization, 10 people do 80% of the work, yeah, right? So, so that, that is a very, very interesting dynamic. And so those are the organizations that I think are gonna adopt this. You're more than your resume, and we want somebody who's more than their resume because we're not hiring a worker. We're hiring somebody who's a common stakeholder. And so I believe in the next five years, this entire dislocation, not disruption, dislocation of hiring is going to occur. I hope so. I think, going back to what you said earlier, the control is coming to the candidates. The candidates are going to have the choice. If they, if they demand it. And if they're given a product to do it. The other side of the equation are people that are currently in organizations that are not adapting, mm -hmm. that are forcing people to come back to the workforce. I think that we're going to see, as the vaccine rolls out, as this pandemic starts to, to roll down and, and herd immunization, whatever you want to call it, becomes, you know, the numbers go down, people are going to start going back to work one way or another mm -hmm. and how a company opens the doors for them. Are they going to open the doors and welcome them when they want to come in? Or are they going to say, hey, get your asses back in the seats here. You're going to see a migration of talent in certain areas. Any foresight into this? Yeah, I, I think it's really important that you understand that everybody has different risk um, profiles they have to manage at home. You know, you never know. Uh, they've got an adult uh, or an uh, at-risk spouse or a child or, so I, I think it's really important to understand that. And then also, to your point you mentioned earlier, is to trust that people are mature adults and want to do the right thing. You hire somebody to do a job for you. Yeah, I hear that, absolutely hear that. Um, you know, but if that argument held through, if true, why did you ever demand they come in before the pandemic, right? So I, I think it's important to understand that people are managing risk, threshold, risk thresholds. I also think you have to give people credit and understand that their personal development will be hindered if they're not in the office because the training occurs there. The in-person, like we're doing training uh, once every two weeks. I put on an in-house training. We actually take over this whole studio and half my team is still at home and half my team is here. And it's their choice. And it will be what, whenever we come out on the other side of whatever this looks like. Side. Yeah, I still personally think that we will have masks three months a year for the rest of our lives. Mm. I think we're gonna have seasonal. Um, uh, uh, seasonal masking. Yeah, we'll have seasonal masking. So you may see a flex up and down in that, especially depending on temperature and where you live in the country, et cetera. Right, the de population density. Yeah, so, so I think you need to have just an open mind. I think the flip side too is you can't have your cake and eat it too. So if you're the person who is the employee of, of the company, and you come back and your desk has been moved to a floating desk, but you lost your corner office or your window seat. I'd be open to that. Right? You can't get pissed. You can't. Right? And then if you come in and it's not quite home as it was before, you can't get pissed. It's everybody's doing the best Everyone they can in this environment. Everyone needs to adapt it because we're all, all in this together. Correct. Another interesting point, too, is the plight of the working parent right now. Mm. Um, from a performance review perspective, from a job performance perspective, the weight of having to take care of children at home. Schools, a lot of schools aren't open and they're trying to homeschool. They got kids at home. You're trying to get your work done during the day and your kid is knocking on your door and banging when you're trying to, trying to do a Zoom call. That's gonna have a big effect on the broader picture. And I think that we're in such a short time period right now, we're only you know, almost coming upon 12 months of this pandemic. We haven't seen the long-term effects from an employee performance perspective. Any insight from your side talking to your clients? Yeah, first of all, parenting in itself without this overlay that we're in right now is just, you know, I've been amazed that the parents, dual parents, single parents who are able to make that world go round and still raise a really healthy human being. I mean, it's amazing to me. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I worry about the people who are stretched too thin. I, I worry about the mental health. Um, I worry about what they think about laying in bed at night, staring at the ceiling, wondering what's going to happen to their children. I think there's probably, especially the great parents, are more worried about what's going to happen to their children than their job. Um, and I think the people who employ those people need to have an extra helping of empathy uh, on the long term, not because it's a fancy word right now or it's an Instagram tag, is you have to have an incredibly healthy, 
helping of empathy moving forward um, and not just because people are watching. I couldn't agree more to that. And I think that empathy is a buzzword and it can't be a buzzword. It needs to be an action word. The, in my opinion, the real true measure is going to be this empathy quotient of an organization, how much talk they are versus action. Mm -hmm. How much wiggle room do they give? How much space do they give to folks to say, you know what? I've been working you know, three weeks straight nonstop. I don't go into the office anymore, so obviously I'm on the computer at 8 a.m., taking a break here and there for the kids. I'm back on again after they go to bed. It doesn't stop. I'm getting burnt out. Mm -hmm. Being able to be comfortable saying that to the powers that be, where they say, you know what, Adam? Just take a couple days off. We got this. It's not going to affect you. What companies do now and how they act now is going to define their success for the future from a talent retention mm -hmm. and a talent access perspective. Yeah, there's no doubt. I mean. This is the time really where you feel, you know, it's, it's the two minute drill. And the athletes step on the field and they put the ball over the line or there's who fake getting hurt. Um, and so, you know, this is, this, is a, this is a very interesting time and it's where I think that brands are gonna be made. And, and, and I know I said this to you almost two years ago when we talked about developing hiring brands. And I said, brands are most important coming out of a crisis. If you go into a crisis with a really good brand, you will come out stronger, faster, and be able to have a larger land grab than anybody else. And if you're an organization that is at least deemed as fair, I don't think you have to over-index to being, you know. To, uh, to extreme. Yeah, I, I don't think you have to over-index. I think what you have to do is your teammates, your employees, your partners, just have to know that you're thinking about them and you're trying to make the best possible decision for them as an individual as well as those that um, are part of the big team. Um, because you still have to make a profit in order to feed everybody. You have to share that oxygen across the board. But I think right now that with technology, uh, there are certain people though who have seven people living in a one bedroom apartment. I don't know how that- Stealing Wi-Fi from out. their neighbors. Correct, or, or making things work by borrowing, borrowing Wi-Fi from the neighbors. <laughs> is you know, you and I sit here as incredibly privileged people owning our own business, living in nice homes, um, and having no employer putting pressure on us. And so it's easy for us to sit here and say, right? So those who are raising children, those who have higher risk pro, uh, profiles uh, because of this pandemic, you've got to really almost take it on a one-to-one -one basis uh, based upon what they're going through. And you're right, and at the end of this, some may leave those organizations, and the organization can't get jaded because of that. I think we're going to see a big talent migration mm -hmm. in the next four months. Yeah. Joe, what has been keeping you up at night over the last year? Besides from good whiskey. <sighs> Making sure that I prepare every person in my organization for where we're on our way to from both uh, capabilities, aptitude, um, fulfillment of what they want to become, being part of the team, getting them the right coaching, um, getting them outside the Joe echo chamber. Um, and, you know, so preparing them for this um, rocket ship that we're on, uh, because I don't want anybody to miss an opportunity that they're going to have. Um, and I don't want to cheat what we're about to bring to the marketplace over the next few years. I love the man. It's inspiring. And if I was going to pull any of these folks from behind the camera, or behind that glass over there, on the side, in one of the rooms, and I said, what is Joe like as a leader? What do you think they would say? Oh, I can't answer that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll bring someone on there. Uh, and one of the most awesome things that you've been doing, and we had this conversation back in April, said, you know what, I'm never going to have a time in my life where I'm going to have the ability to follow one of my passions, which is learning how to fly. Tell us a little bit about what that journey has been like for you. Oh, gosh. How has that helped you step away from the day-to-day -day business of, of building and running this empire and just focus on something that you always wanted to do deep inside? Yeah, since I was a little kid, my dad worked for Grumman, and I grew up around airplanes and, you know, got into the workforce and committing. Intelligent people commit a lot of time to learning how to fly, because if you don't, you might not be flying a long time. It takes and a so, lot of mental effort to fly. It does. I will tell you, it's one of the toughest things I've ever done. So, um, you know, I, I decided that, that this was a chance in time that I wasn't traveling, you know, 70% of the time. And, you know, you've got to commit the hours to it, both book study as well as time behind the stick. 
And uh, it's been great. Um, I've been you know, fortunate to have this great in instructor and these series of people who work with me. And I uh, got my first plane, and uh, I'm excited about that. And I already have gone up and visited clients in Raleigh, Durham. And you know, to leave Palm Beach and have a cup of coffee in the Keys in 58 minutes is yeah. crazy. Um, but it's fun. But intellectually, I, I love to learn. Intellectually, it's stimulating. Uh, it brings in the engineer in me, brings in the thrill seeker in me, all that kind of stuff. When you're behind the stick and focused, mm -hmm. well, let me ask this question. When you are behind the stick, are you able to be laser focused on the oh, mission at hand and be. not thinking about? You have to be. And how has that helped you from, a, from your own mental health perspective? Oh, I think that's something that I was um, genetically gifted with and then developed over the years. Um, you know, it's called obsessive compulsive behavior. Uh, at least when you acknowledge it, maybe it's less obsessive compulsive. Uh, but yeah, if you're going to fly and those who do fly, in fact, I was chatting with a very dear friend, Don Weber, um, who's CEO of a company out in Arizona, who has had his pilot's license for a long time. We were talking about it literally two hours ago. And you can't think about anything else because you put your life at risk. Um, seriously, and I don't mean to be like a tough guy about it, but anybody who has flown seriously. It's serious business. <laughs> there are so many things going on in that plane that you can be compromised with. Um, so you have to, there, there was, there's only been once or twice that I was scheduled to fly that I wasn't in the right headspace that I canceled um, my training session because I knew I wasn't in the right headspace and I wasn't going to leave behind my wife and kids and my team. Of course. How much do you push it into bed whether... Never. Okay, there we go. There's no, a, never. I was going to say, because from a training perspective, never, you never compromise. Never, it's not never, worth never. it. No. It's just not worth it. No. You're not a professional. You're not, I you're don't not do flying it for a living. cargo or, I don't or do it passenger for a living. planes. Yeah. Yeah. Why yeah. put yourself up there? No. no. Have, you, have you taken your wife and kids up yet? No. no. When do you think you'll be ready to do that? Uh, I wouldn't. Um, I, I fly only with another pilot. And you know we're continuing to upgrade. For those that know, we're looking at like TBM 950, which is a crazy plane. Uh, but I'm going to take the route of Arnold Palmer. Those that didn't know that, Arnold, I think, got his license at 14, and he uh, finished up with a Citation 10. But he flew around the world, around the country. Um, and even though he was a great pilot, I think he had 20,000 hours. But um, from what I understand, he sat in PIC, pilot and control, left seat, but he always had uh, an experienced pilot with him. So, you know, I'm, I'm not going to screw around. I, I, my ego is huge, but not when it comes to sitting in a plane and you know, I still get to do it all, fly it, jam it up, but I have really the experts sitting next to me if I something goes sideways. What's the next big thing coming for the Mullins Group and Dragonfly? Um, teaching others how to do what we do, both in the search business and then bringing it to the corporate level and helping them create a, a clearer path for the individuals who deserve a clear shot at opportunities that right now are judged exclusively on the most antiquated piece of data, the resume that's ever existed. So we are creating products and processes and training programs, and I'm getting a lot of time now to speak to corporations about how they want to rethink how they're going to um, provide a, a clearer shot on goal on people who decide to want to apply. So that's worth next. The shift is happening between recruiting and talent access and the companies that understand this and continue to put people first and continue to put the resources, people are your number one resource. Yeah. Those are the companies that are going to succeed and those are the companies that I want to work with. Mm -hmm. And that's why when I brand myself, when I do the podcast, when I put my marketing out there, the ones that engage, they're the ones who get it. Mm -hmm. And those are the ones I want to stay focused on. And I truly think we're in the midst of an evolution and a revolution in the talent access business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're right. And Joe, I asked you this question back in April, and I want to see how much it's changed. This pandemic has affected all of us, good ways, bad ways. So many people have experienced unimaginable tragedies and losses. But on the other side of that, there's the silver linings. And I asked this question back to you in April, and I want to see how much it has changed. I'd love if you could share with everybody a personal silver lining and a professional silver lining that you've experienced in the last couple of months. Oh, gosh. Um... I think it, what's amazing is um, we can't forget, you know, we, we hold all these people in incredibly high regard, these celebrities and these athletes and these influencers. And they had nothing to do 
with carrying civilization out of what we've been in. And the garbage man and the nurse and the food delivery person and the lineman who today is working somewhere in Dallas, Texas and freezing. Crazy. That's what the world's about. I think we're getting back to values. I think we're getting back to what is most important and it's that time. I mean, the reason I'm here down in Florida, my parents have not seen my kids in a full calendar year. Mm. And I took that for granted. And my kids haven't seen my parents in a full calendar year. And that moment when they saw them in the airport and they ran after him, that was it for me. Yeah. And I literally just grabbed my mom and hugged her and cried because like, I haven't seen her in a year. And, and it just was like this pouring out of, of emotion. And my wife is laughing in the green room right now. But I'm a big sap when it comes to that. And I feel there's just been so much pent up. And then when you have that moment of true human connection, mm. I could talk to my mom on FaceTime, I could talk to her on the phone, but at almost 42 years old, she's, she's my mom. Yeah. And I want to hug her and love her, and I haven't seen her in a year, and it's, it's absolutely been crazy. Um, I want to wrap up, Joe. You know how much I appreciate you. You are truly a beacon to me and to so many others. It was important for me to bring my wife and daughter here from A, to meet you, and B, just to see what's possible, mm. and to see what my dream is and what I want to build out, and combining my career as a recruiter, a talent access consultant, and also this crazy world of the podcast, which has blown up and really brought out this extra gear that I never knew that I had. And this skill and this passion is something that I love doing and I hope to you know, inspire others the way you inspire me. So I wanna thank you, Joe, for your friendship and your mentorship and thank you for joining us today on the podcast. You got it, man. Good to have you. Joe Mullings, everybody. Thanks. Wisdom is forever, but for us, it's time to go. Thank you for joining us. Luckily, we'll be back with our next episode soon, jam-packed with more incredible humans. Thank you for listening, subscribing, and sharing. To join the conversation, search The Pausecast on LinkedIn. And to catch up on past episodes and more info, please visit www.thepausecast.com. <laughs>